Hello, hi everybody. Hey, if I can just have your attention. So thank you so much for being here. This is really awesome. I know we've been dying to do collaborations and things together and it's nice to see it beginning to take shape. My name is Olivia Mulerga. I'm a second year MA student at Thunderbird. And it is my pleasure to invite all of you to this fireside chat with Dr. Simon Adams and Dr. Sanjeev Kagram. So imagine if you will that there's a fire over here <laughs> somewhere. Uh, first, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjeev Kagram, who is the Dean and Director General of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Prior to Thunderbird, Dr. Kagram was the John Park Young Chair at Occidental College in Southern California. And I had the opportunity to hang out with some of his former colleagues and students at Occidental, and I can tell you that they were very sad to see him go. So their losses are gain. Um, Dean Kagram has a lot of experience in IPE, international political economy. He is an expert in global leadership, in sustainable development. And uh, fairly recently, he was named a global leader, a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. And he wrote the United Nations Secretary General's report on the impact of the global economic crisis. So welcome with me, everybody, Dean Kagra. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Sequela, and I'm the president of the International Law Society here at uh, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Um, so it is my honor to introduce Dr. Simon Adams. Um, after looking at his very long and um, impressive resume, um, he, he's not only you know, a great academic, but he's got really great practical experience. Um, he is the executive director um, of the Global, Global Center for Responsibility to Protect. Um, he's also worked exclusively with governments and civil society organizations in South Africa. East Timor, Rwanda, and um, other countries as well. Dr. Adams is an author of four books. He has written numerous articles. And what I found also very impressive was that you were the vice, you are the vice chair of the International Advisory Board of Skatistan, Correct. which um, is an award-winning nonprofit organization dedicated to using skateboarding to expose Afghan, Cambodian, South African students um, to education leadership development. Yep. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Please welcome Job with me. <laughs> I think I switched on already. <laughs> so I want to thank uh, Olivia and Alex. You know, uh, when I became Dean of the Thunderbird School of Global Management, um, one of the first people to welcome me here was uh, Dean Doug Sylvester of the law school. And he's been an incredible partner, even in our short time together we see this as the first of many, 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 many collaborations together. So I want to thank him very much and his team for their leadership and partnership in all of this. Um, I want to thank Diana Bowman, especially the Associate Dean of Law School uh, and Kelly, <laughs> let's give her a big hand, um, who really, with Kelly Kreiser of Thunderbird for Good, really put this together. <laughs> Helen Wu and her team at the Career Management Center at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Um, Aaron Schneiderman and Austin uh, Prutch from Thunderbird School and the Law School are sort of event organizers. Where are they, Aaron and Austin? Somewhere, fantastic work. Uh, and the Net Impact Club, and of course, most importantly, the students of the Law School and Thunderbird. As I said, this we see as the beginning of a long partnership, not only amongst us as dean and faculty, deans and faculty and administrators, but amongst our students soon, hopefully very soon, we'll be sitting next door <laughs> and doing lots more of these in a even closer proximity. So it's just wonderful to welcome Simon. I had the great privilege of spending a little time with you, at least on the phone and, and a couple of minutes in person. Um, in many ways, we have such similar backgrounds, our transnational sort of origins and yeah. pathways through life. And also the, the, the pathway of professionalism from you know, inside the academy, um, you know, uh, Simon was a, a, a senior leader at Monash University and then going into the nonprofit sector and public policy 
global policy and then going back again. So it's great to have you here. Thank you again. We look forward to many, many more of these going forward here in DC and Geneva around the world. You know, for me, as many of you know, you've heard particularly my Thunderbird uh, community knows about my own background as a, a refugee of Idi Amin's Uganda. This set of issues around the responsibility to protect um, and the mass atrocities, genocide, democide, uh, is a very per personal one for me. Yeah. And I guess to start off, Simon, you know, one wonders why anyone would spend their life doing work on this when it is <laughs> such a hard thing to think about and engage in. What gives you the inspiration, the passion, and really the determinism? Uh, determination to do this type of work in the world. Yeah, thanks, Ajit, and, and thanks everyone for having me here and for, for coming out. Um, I got to say, Arizona is such a beautiful place. I, I come from Western Australia and sun and desert. <laughs> and I, if, I, if I was studying here, I don't know that I would be here. I think I'd be in a, in a bowl or a half pipe somewhere. <laughs> Remember, there's a fire, there's a fire right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, thanks to to Di and to Kelly and to everybody who, who made this um, possible. I mean, I have a kind of a glib answer and I, I spoke to some students earlier today and I, I mentioned this, so I apologize if you've heard this already, but I do get asked that question. Like, you know, typically um, my wife's a physiotherapist and we'll be at a dinner party or something and somebody will say, well, how do you, you know, work in a world of genocide and mass atrocities? And I said, well, but you know, it's easy, I'm dead inside, so, you know. It, <laughs> It's fine. Yeah. And that's the glib you know, answer to a, a more difficult question. But I think that you know, my background, the personal is really important in this. I mean, my, my family come from the north of Ireland, from the lovely little seaside village of Belfast, if you've ever heard of it. Um, and that's very much a big part of my personal history, them leaving under circumstances of armed conflict and sectarianism. And, and growing up in a, an immigrant environment where everybody else in the world who I knew, first of all, there were 12 of us living in a small three bedroom house, three generations. Mm -hmm. And everybody I knew came from Ireland, didn't come from New Zealand or Australia where I was, where I was living. And the things that were normal to me, like stories of people, uncles in prison, my aunt was killed um, by British military intelligence. Um, the conflict in, in all its, you know, manifestations was just a normal part of life. So I think that it was only when I got older that I started to realize that this was actually an unusual thing. But I think that, and I'd be really interested what, if, you, if you agree with this, but I think if you have that kind of a background, first of all, it made me really focused on how lucky and privileged I was to have the life that I had, that I didn't have to endure those things. And secondly, it made me very susceptible to social justice causes to struggles for people to be free or, or against injustice. And so, you know, when I was 17, I, I had to involve a girl somehow, right? So like I met a <laughs> South African girl and next thing you know, you join the anti-apartheid struggle in the ANC and you're in South Africa, you know? Um, Many roads <laughs> yeah. to South Africa. So. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I think that, you know, that the personal very much did, it, did affect me and, and made me kind of drawn to this, this kind of work. And then as an adult, then I worked in a number of conflict zones and including in Rwanda after the genocide. And that was the point at which I think I was more deeply affected. And, you know, I remember visiting a a friend in Rwanda and uh, who worked at uh, a site, a genocide memorial, which had been a mass grave during the, the genocide. And um, they were actually exhuming the grave on the, the day that I arrived. The, the grave had, so at the end of the genocide, they'd simply put the bodies in a, a very rudimentary mass grave. And then they were trying to build a, a proper memorial and relocate the body on the same site. And so, you know, I went there and because of the work I've done, I think I've got fairly good dissociative skills and it wasn't the first time, unfortunately, I'd seen stuff like that. 
but they were taking skeletons out of a mass grave. And then, sorry, this is a really dark way to begin, but, but one of the skeletons that came out was actually um, wearing a summer's dress and it was perfectly preserved. I don't know how, mm. clearly a young woman, a floral dress, like any one of women here could have been wearing. And it just kind of stopped me in my tracks. And I think that's what happens when you do this kind of work as well. There's always something that trips you up a little bit from time to time. And so I just remember thinking again and again, looking at, at her and the dress and thinking, what were the last thoughts that went through her head when she realized no one was coming to help? No one was coming to save her. The international community did not care about Rwanda in 1994. And that that was the fate that had befallen her. And, you know, I don't want to overbuild it, but in my mind, at least, that there was a strong sense of, well, if I have a certain skill set and I can do something to make sure that this doesn't happen again, I'm going to do everything in my power to, to try and be that person who helps tip it a little bit. Thank you. Um, for those, we have a full range of different types of participants in the audience, some who are legal scholars or the responsibility to protect and others who are just starting to understand what it means. Maybe you could just give a kind of, uh, you know, sort of an easily accessible uh, entry point into what, is it, what does it mean? Um, where did it come from? Why is it so important in today's world? Yeah, I think these two things are really closely connected because I think it really is the international failure in Rwanda. And, and at Srebrenica in Bosnia the, the following year, which really caused human rights activists, diplomats, people in the UN, like Kofi Annan, who was the, one of the founders of our center, who just passed away, unfortunately, recently, to really think about, like, is this the world that we want to live in? Like, we want to live in a world where a million people can die in 100 days in Rwanda, and the international community does nothing. And, or is there... Or are there some crimes that are so shocking that they should unite us, you know, no matter what? And so the responsibility to protect as an idea comes out of that. Kofi set up an international commission and it comes out of that. And then it's adopted in 2005 at the UN World Summit as a kind of universally accepted as this idea. And the short answer is the trajectory since then in the 12 years, whatever it is since then, is not one of, un, you know, perfect success. Syria, uh, Myanmar last year. But I think, and I, as I said this morning, you know, I'm very conscious of the fact that we lose more than we win. But I think the ideas have a power and a resonance that anybody can relate to. And um, I'm sure anybody here can relate to and anybody in different parts. I travel all over the world. I've never heard anybody say, actually, I think it's okay if people suffer genocide over there. You know, and so I think... It's that basic idea and it's a mobilizing principle. And so our center was established to kind of work with the UN Security Council and with the Human Rights Council, very small NGO, but to work both inside the system and outside the system to kind of make these ideas not just be abstract ideas, but actually be something that has meaning in the real world. Because, you know, I mentioned Srebrenica. I was in Srebrenica in 2015 for the 20th anniversary of the genocide. And, you know, there was a big thing. Bill Clinton was there and all these heads of state and stuff. And then afterwards, we all went to the graveyard where um, several thousand Muslim boys and men are buried. And I'd met a family that day, earlier that day, just talking to them who were reburying their father that day. Because the, after the genocide, the Serbs actually dug up the mass graves and hid a lot of the bodies. And so they're still reburying people. There was 136 reburials in, in 2015. And so this family asked me if I wanted to participate in the reburial, you know? So we went to the graveyard and in Bosnia, I don't know if there's any Bosniaks here, but the tradition is they, they build a really shallow grave and they just put the coffin in and then you put mounds of dirt over the top. So it's very physical. Mm. And they're like, do you want to participate? So you're like, you're literally on your hands and knees with hands of dirt, that hands full of dirt, putting it on top of the grave. And when you're doing that in Srebrenica, like you become very focused on how far we've come since 1994 or since 1995, since Rwanda, since Srebrenica. 
but also how much further we still have to go to get to the kind of world that I want to live in. And hopefully the kind of world, I know the world that you want to live in and the world that a lot of other people here want to live in, where no people should endure that because of the God they believe in, because of how they identify, because of their race, their ethnicity or, or anything else. So, yeah. So maybe if you could, Simon, just say in a, in a few words, what does the responsibility of protect, to protect entail? What obligations does it impose yeah. on governments and other stakeholders? And how does it interact with this, you know, the enshrined sort of legal framework of sovereignty mm. where there seems to be so many potential contradictions with the responsibility? Yeah, so when the responsibility to protect was like adopted in 2005, journalists like wet their pants, you know, in excitement and and one of the things that was like said was like, this was the most significant readjustment to sovereignty since the Treaty of Westphalia. Mm, a little bit of journalistic hubris there, but we'll forgive them for that maybe. The journalists are having a tough time at the moment if you haven't noticed. Um, but I think that it did represent a, a very real shift that was taking place from sovereignty being a kind of license to kill, you know, sovereignty being something where Idi Amin can decide that Indians cannot live in his country anymore. And what did the rest of the world do about that? That's a Ugandan issue. That's not anybody else's issue. To an idea that like sovereignty is responsibility and that that should be the defining principle um, of sovereignty. And so I think that is something that has shifted and it, it kind of became clear to me that we had won the battle of ideas, if not the political and policy outcomes. When, when the Syrian civil war started in 2011, you know, and that became more and more of a dominating my life. And then say into say 2012 or 2013, I remember the Syrian foreign minister speaking at the opening session of the UNGA and him trying to use the language of R2P to twist it. Cause that's what like, all those kinds of people do. They want to take the language of human rights or whatever and twist it and saying, yes, of course we have a responsibility to protect. And we're upholding it by killing these terrorists who are threatening our country. But even in that, in the, the darkest situation, there was a, 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 a way in which I thought, huh, we're actually, we're winning this battle, at least of the, the thought battle, but we're, now we've got to actually win the policy and practical outcome battle. And that's, that's much more of a story of, wins and losses um, than the battle of ideas. So say a little bit more about that. Where have we come in terms of wins and losses, if we could put it in that, or successes and ongoing challenges? Maybe give an example of a time when, or an episode or an event, um, a case where, the, the, where R2P really did make a major yeah. difference on an outcome. And another one perhaps where, you know, you would have thought it should have, yeah. but it really did. So very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll do, give an easy example. Like right now, as of this very moment, there are eight UN peacekeeping missions in the world which have R2P and the protection of civilians as part of their mandate. That means that 95%, actually it's 96% of the more than 100,000 UN peacekeepers in the world right now are actually on those missions. And those are missions in Democratic Republic of the Congo, Central African Republic, Darfur in Sudan, um, and in Mali and other places. And for all their failings and all the weaknesses of the UN system, those people are literally the difference between life and death for many, many, many people in those countries. So I think those are one example of success. And there's, there's loads of others in terms of the early warning and countries that you're trying to tip in a direction. Because the reality is if you get to the mass graves and machete stage, you've already failed and you're, you're dealing with something that's already happened. But, you know, when I, even in a, say, a case that, that really has kind of like um, wreaked havoc on, on me for the last year or so, the Rohingya minority in Myanmar. Now, on one level, that was an absolute abject failure. We didn't stop the genocide from happening. You know, it was a genocide. I don't say that as a rhetorical flourish. And say it in terms of genocidal intent and outcome. Um, we didn't stop it from happening and the Security Council did absolutely nothing. 
mainly because of the Chinese veto, by the way. But even in the midst of that, we raised awareness about the situation. Bangladesh responded appropriately in terms of dealing with the refugees. We now have a number of countries that have pl- applied targeted sanctions, and we did a lot of the advocacy around this on the generals. We know the generals were responsible, the 27 generals in particular, senior military officers. The United States has applied sanctions, Canada, the EU, so that's 27 states there, other states. The EU is now looking at actually trade sanctions and withdrawing favored nation status from Myanmar. And we're only just getting started you know, on, on how we, we want to uh, address the Myanmar regime. And I think that in and of itself, maybe for, for some of the younger students, that seems like a very small price to pay for a genocide. But keep in mind that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, the answer to these sorts of situations was nothing. Nothing happened. No accountability. So, you know, I won't rest. I'm a stubborn, I mean, it's the Irish thing, you know. <laughs> I'm a stubborn person. We have a saying in Irish that uh, uh, the ax forgets, but not the tree, you know. And I think that, you know, I'm one of those people that I won't rest until we see President Assad of Syria in handcuffs in The Hague. You know, I similarly won't rest until we see these generals in Myanmar paying a real price in terms of international justice. You know, our, our gaze, though, is drawn to the, the sort of cases like uh, Myanmar, the yeah. Rohingya, and Syria. They're always in the news and, you know, even when there may be lack of effectiveness of the work that we do or increasing effectiveness, as you're saying, in terms of not being able to prevent the genocide from happening, but at least addressing the fact that there was mass atrocities yeah. and there should be, um, uh, right, you know, some punishments, some real, real sanctions, real um, uh, consequences. Tell us about the one, you know, a little bit more about these cases that people aren't paying attention to. Right. And what, I mean, yes, we have peacekeeping missions there or, you know, UN forces on the, on the ground, but how can we really understand what's going on in these places that, and, and try to make a difference when they really get no attention right. at all relative to the main cases? Yeah, I think that, you know, there's, there's very bad cases that are happening that get almost no attention. So Yemen is one in particular where the Saudis and, and the UAE have absolute, it's the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world. 20 million people dependent on humanitarian aid, six to eight million people facing famine this year in Yemen. And it's not a natural famine. This is a, a man-made, war-made famine that's happening. But, you know, I'm always, a lot of our work, I would say 90% of our work is on prevention. And the, the problem with prevention is the counterfactual, right? You always run into the, the counterfactual. So, you know, how do you show the mass graves that were not dug? <laughs> the, the women who were not raped, the children who did not become child soldiers, and the schools that were not burnt down and destroyed because you prevented something from happening. The counterfactual is like the bane of my existence <laughs> because it's a success, but how do you measure that, that success? And you always then run into the naysayers or, or in some cases, the governments who will say, well, you know, yeah, we were worried about Kenya a few years ago in the election, but it was fine, right? So we don't need to worry anymore. Um, so a lot of what we do is in the preventive field and, and is about early warning and, and timely response. But for example, you know, we work on situations now that are, you know, that break my heart that they're not getting more attention. I mean, Cameroon is one. I don't know if there's anybody here from Cameroon, but you know, there's a, a very bad identity-based conflict going on in, in Cameroon. And every day my phone is filled up with messages from people on the ground in Cameroon crying out for help and sending pictures of their village on fire or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's one that's just completely off, not even below the radar. It's like not even it's close to the radar of the international community. And I think sometimes the international community still, despite this progress that's been made, despite the, the normative advances and despite all the stuff that people like me go on about in relation to the battle of ideas and normative advances, I think sometimes still the international community is far more comfortable kind of wringing their hands after something terrible is happening and saying, oh, never again, than it is about actually acting in a timely and decisive manner to to prevent something from happening. So let me ask you a a slightly unfair question, but I think you're as good a person as any to help us 
untangle them. Some would argue that globalization has just exacerbated these types of um, horrible uh, events. Others would say actually globalization is part of the major solution. And with greater globalization, we'll have less and less of these. How do we understand the role of globalization in um, mass atrocity, genocide, genocide, genocide? Yeah, I think it's like one of the things about that question, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, actually, is that um, it's similar to the, what I was saying about the prevention stuff, is that we live in a world that's very much based around news cycles. And um, if there's an airstrike on Aleppo, I could see it on my phone or on CNN within an hour of it happening. The lifting of millions of people out of poverty and the fall in, in average, uh, the extension of average life expectancy or the fact that 180 million people in Africa got electricity for the first time during the last decade. Uh, that's, that's not, it's too long in scope. It doesn't run on newspapers. And it's the other story about globalization that we actually don't hear enough of. And I think that these things are not neutral. It's what kind of globalization are you talking about or what aspect of globalization? And I think that's what I would say. And I know that, that you feel very similarly, but I mean, when I look around the world today, I certainly see the, the downsides as well. Um, but, you know, I'm, I work in a world where, you know, we're very focused on the fact that 68.5 million people in the world right now are displaced by persecution, conflict, and mass atrocity. Pope Francis has talked about a globalization of indifference. And that's a globalization that I, that I want to fight against and that I think that, that we need to address because it is a byproduct product of, of this as well but yeah i don't think we can i think there's a tendency to reduce it to globalization is bad or globalization is good whereas i don't think that either is necessarily true i'm going to ask one more question then open it up and see if we have some questions from the audience and that has to do with you know we're in this age i you know my colleagues and community at thunderbird hear me talk about it a lot here at asu the fourth industrial revolution yeah. all these new technologies <laughs> and <laughs> old technologies <laughs> so, <laughs> well done. Um, new technologies that have potential to be incredibly transformative uh, new access to data and uh, you know uh, uh, satellite and so forth and so on uh, how are are they enabling and supporting um, the work on RTP at all and if so do you have some examples about you know, how these technologies and these uh, new ways of uh, utilizing um, information and, and capacities can make a difference in the work that you do and that we should be doing? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, that's, I mean, it's such an interesting question, isn't it, about how this stuff works. And it's, I think it's a challenge for all of us. Well, in my case, I turned 50 this year. And I, yes, I do give my, one of my teenage daughters my phone to you know, download it, update it, and show me how to use it properly. Um, so I feel somewhat reticent <laughs> going into this conversation. But and I sort of mentioned this at the the Thunderbird or the the Net Impact chapter meeting that I was at this morning. But a long time ago, in the decade called the 1990s, I was a university <laughs> student, and I remember those decades. <laughs> it was a long time ago, <laughs> and you know, I was. I was doing a, um, an exam. I had this friend and this friend was very involved in the Eastern Marie's struggle. And I was very involved in politics and activism. And he did his exams early and went off to East Timor. And then I was studying for an exam and I was literally standing outside the exam hall and somebody was reading the newspaper and they're like, oh, it's terrible what's happened in East Timor. And did you hear about that student that got killed? It was my friend, Kamal Bamahaj, the only foreigner killed in the Dili massacre in 1991. And the thing about that story is that a, a television journalist called Max Stahl filmed the massacre and hid in the, in the graveyard and then buried the videotape in a grave and then got captured by the Indonesians military, got the crap beaten out of him left, was thrown out of the country, came back into the country, dug up the videotapes, took them out of the country, 
And then that's how the world found out about the massacre and saw the massacre. And then it became news because prior to that, it was just, I mean, who cares what the East Timorese say? Who cares about these little human rights activists in this part of the world most people don't even know about? And so it wasn't news. And it's almost impossible to imagine that story happening today. And, you know, every day I get sent text messages, emails, images, videos of what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Cameroon, what's happening in Myanmar, straight from the people there. It amazes me that you know, even people in the, what we would think of as the most remote kind of part of the world, they've got a, a, a flip phone or some kind of phone and they're filming stuff or taking pictures and they'll send it to somebody. They know there's these crazy human rights guys who will want to see this and will want to do something about it. And so for us, that technology is a great tool. We can harness it to fight that kind of evidence battle to push back against the denialists, the people who say that nothing is, is happening or that we shouldn't care. But at the same time, we are also operating in a world where you know, genocide denialism can also be people all over the internet saying the Holocaust never happened. You, know, you can have all kinds of racist trolls and people propagating hate speech on Facebook and other places. So yeah, technology's neutral. The people who use it are not. Yeah. Good. Let me open it up and see if there's some questions from our students, faculty, community members, staff. Don't be bashful. Please, and let us know who you are. Uh, give your name and uh, if you're a student, what, what you're studying. Uh, my name is Myla. I'm a student uh, at Central. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Hello, hello, okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> uh, my name is Myla, I'm a student at Thunderbird. Um, and my question is, how do you keep people from forgetting um, the atrocities that happen? Because I find that even though social media can be a great tool, you can see what's happening in Syria on YouTube. Um, it, can, it can also be really easy after two, six months, a year to forget that these things are happening and that there should be consequences to actions that people have done. So how do you keep people, how do you keep that in people's memories, especially when you're talking to politicians who might have an incentive to forget that mm -hmm. these, <laughs> these events have happened, you know, because after a while, people don't wanna hear about these things. They'd rather forget. No, uh, so um, even before that decade called the 1990s, there was another decade called the 1980s <laughs> and um, when I was in sixth grade I think it was fifth grade or sixth grade I met a holocaust survivor first holocaust survivor I had ever met and her name was Herta Freiberg she was a German Jew she survived Auschwitz she told her story to our class I remember the whole class crying at the end of the class she made every kid in the class line up in a single file line and she was whispering to each of them. And I remember coming to the front of the class and she had a sleeve rolled up and she had a tattoo and she was making every kid touch the tattoo and rub it. She was like, rub it. See, it's real. Like, touch the tattoo. And then when they were rubbing it, she would like lean forward and she did to me, of course, because I waited my turn like a good boy. And she said, Someday people will tell you this never happened. And I remember it's burned into my brain. I was in like fifth grade. And I remember thinking, what's this crazy old Jewish woman talking about? People will say this never happened. You know, this is the Holocaust. You just heard this amazing story about, about Auschwitz and so forth. But she was politically conscious enough and politically aware enough to understand genocide denialism and understand how the world works and understand attention spans and understand how politics works in the world. I never thought I would live in a world where, where neo-Nazis would be allowed to parade the streets of modern democracies, not mentioning any by name, but I never thought I'd live in a world where genocide denialism regarding the Holocaust would become mainstream in some European countries again. And so I think that challenge is the same challenge with all of this sort of stuff. And then I think the most, the simpler 
answer to your question is that there are lots of human rights organizations like mine and others that just simply will not let governments walk away from this sort of stuff and shirk their responsibilities. And I think that's the role of an active citizenry. I don't think you need to be me or you don't need to be a member of a human rights organization or you don't need to be the head of Thunderbird to be doing that. You can be you. You can be whatever you do and whatever job you have and whatever community you live in, wherever you are in the world. That is your job as an active citizen. That's our obligation to each other as human beings, I think. Some other questions? Please introduce yourself. Hi. Hey. I'm João. João Coimbra Souza. I'm a Brazilian lawyer and LLM student here at Sandra de Ocono Law School. And my question is very similar to Michaela, but I think in another perspective, in that language perspective, because my question is, how could we discuss how we treat history without naturalizing genocide and mass atrocities as colonization and slavery or the genocide of indigenous people when we put in terms as taming the land or mm -hmm. exploring, settling. So how could we put the idea of human rights law in a more human perspective on the telling of history? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that all countries have to deal with their national stories, right? And I mean, I, I wasn't born in Australia, but Australia is where I'm from mostly. And I guess is the place I most feel at home. And I remember being in, in school, you know, when you're a kid, Australia was discovered in 1770. And the first thought that came to my head was, was it lost? Like, yeah, what, was it hiding or something? Like, what do you mean it was discovered? Even then, you know, kind of being confused more than outraged about the way in which that history was presented. But I think that all countries have to deal with their pasts. And in some countries, that's more difficult than others. And uh, certainly, I think the whole issue of, of you know, colonialism in different parts of the world, treatment of indigenous peoples and the consequences for indigenous peoples of those treatments is something which I think in what I will, in a really reductionist way, call the white settler states, um, have, have not quite come to terms with. And I think you see that in this country very clearly. You know, I think you see it in my country. I think you see it in a, in a whole range of places. But I think, you know, let me answer it a different way. You know, Germany is a really amazing place. And one of the things I actually really admire about a modern Germany uh, is the extent to which they have not used the horribleness of their past Nazism, followed by Stalinism in the East, as a way of kind of making mealy mouthed excuses about who they are as a people. It's actually caused them to go, what does it mean to be German? What does it mean to be a citizen of a democracy? How do we deal with this terrible legacy? But how do we build a better country in the 21st century? I think that's a really exciting and healthy discussion for Germans to, to be having. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's uh, the sort of country that I admire very much and I think has come so far. I just think in a country like my own, Australia, we're nowhere near uh, that point of view. And I think the denialism about the past is to our eternal discredit. Question over here. All right. Uh, so my name is Dennis Batemi. Uh, I'm the first year MA student at Thunderbird. And I'm also from Uganda. So I have, uh, uh, I think, two questions. And uh, one of them is, is it realistic to assume that countries like DR Congo that are you know, blessed with these mineral resources, is it realistic for us to assume that these countries will actually attain peace in a world where, is it realistic for us to assume that they'll attain peace and the protection of human rights when uh, 
you know, some of the major powers like France are actually benefiting from the status quo in that country. And the second one is what threat does the re-election of, uh, you know, President Bia of uh, Cameroon have on the citizens of that country, considering the long history of, you know, human rights violation uh, and all those kind of atrocities that are happening right now. Thank you. Yeah, I just actually came back from the Congo not long ago. I was in Rwanda and the Congo uh, a month ago. And the Congo is going to have an election at the end of this year. It's going to be a really tough election. It's an election that's going to happen in the context of in the east of the country where there's more than 27 armed groups who are still rampaging and killing civilians. It's also an election that's going to happen in the context of an Ebola outbreak um, in parts of the eastern part of the country as well. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation and there's no easy solutions. I, th I think sometimes we, we, I'm not saying you think this, but we want to find these solutions to complex problems or we then alternatively lapse into a kind of a, 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 histor a sense of historical pessimism. The Congo is a mess. It has been a mess for a long time. Therefore, it will always be a mess. I actually don't accept that. Um, and I, I, I think it does a disservice to the people of the Congo if the rest of the world accepts that. And it serves the interests of those who want to exploit those divisions. And I don't just mean the people inside the country who rely on the exploitation of those minerals and of divisions based on ethnicity or language or whatever. It serves the interests of outside powers as well who traditionally manipulated that part of the world. So I think that you know, progress is possible in places like the Congo. I think we've seen it to some degree, not as much as, as anybody would like, but these are very dangerous times that we're heading into in the, in the Congo in the next, particularly between now and December. Um, and that was certainly my sense when I was, as I said, I was literally just there a little, little while ago. In terms of uh, Cameroon, look, I think things are very, very bleak in Cameroon. And I think the re-election of the president is not going to serve the interests of the English-speaking 20% of the population. Cameroon is essentially on the point of an all-out open civil war between Francophone and, and Anglophone people in the country. There are terrible things happening in the northwest and southwest part of the country, which Nobody seems to be paying all that much attention to, including the African Union, which should be playing, should be more actively engaged around these issues. But it's one of the reasons why, you know, annoying people like myself are doing all that they can to kind of shout as loud as we can. So, you know, I, I do this thing whenever I'm on TV, no matter what I'm being interviewed about, I always try and make sure that I talk a little bit about what I want to talk about. <laughs> So I always try and find a way of slipping in mentions of something like, like uh, even if I'm being interviewed about Myanmar, you know, I slip in a comment about Cameroon and about countries like that, which just seem to get zero attention. There was just an election if people don't know that very, there's a language issue there and the president has been trying to suppress the Anglophone minority who are about 20% of the country and the country is very close to being on the point of an open civil war and there's widespread extrajudicial killings by the security forces, sexual violence, burning down of villages. It's a very, very, very bad situation. It's getting no attention. I have one here and then I'll go in the back afterwards. Hi, my name is Ali. I'm a Thunderbird student. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, um, when we see there's a war, a country is destroyed, but on another part of the world, a company that is selling the weapons, they make a lot of money. And normally you would put uh, embargoes for the sale of weapons and all of that, but still a lot of uh, countries are able to buy weapons and still do what they're not supposed to do. So I want, to, uh, I want your comments on that, that how UN has been more effective in the past 10 years, stopping those com uh, com countries or organizations to buy weapons from the companies. The second question is uh, a little bit controversial. So we see there's a, a Israel-Palestine conflict since like 50 years probably. And there have been several resolutions passed in UN Security Council. But personally, I have not observed a lot of restrictions or sanctions being placed on both of the countries. 
So can you please comment on that as well? Thank sure. You. Yeah, look, I, I think that, and maybe this goes back to something that Sanjeev was, was talking about before, you know, when I look at like how the world changes, like I, I had the enormous privilege to be part of a, uh, in a very small way of a movement that changed a country forever, South Africa and the ANC. And that didn't happen by accident. It wasn't like whites woke up one day and said, you know what, I think racism might be bad. <laughs> Is it bad? Let's stop doing it. Um, it was a result of an enormous struggle. And I think that change came from a very powerful combination of forces. It came from governments who were unprepared, partly because their own citizenry were putting so much pressure on them, unprepared to tolerate the apartheid continuing as a system. It came from um, business who were in many cases forced to divest from South Africa by people who said, well, we won't buy your product if you continue to make it in apartheid South Africa. And it came from civil society from an international movement, not just the ANC. And, in, and I, first of all, joined the international movement before I joined the ANC, an international anti-apartheid movement. And I think that is a powerful combination of forces. That's the forces that helped end apartheid in South Africa. It's also the forces that helped bring in the arms trade treaty in 2015. And we haven't gone as far as I would like to see with the arms trade treaty. It hasn't been ratified by a number of countries. Hint, hint. <laughs> but a number have, and it enables us to put pressure on them. You know, I love it when governments make those commitments and people go, well, they're just doing that because they want good PR. Yeah, but now we can hold them to it. So be true to those promises in the arms trade treaty. And so we're much, I mean, technology helps us a lot in that regard. Like we know who's selling weapons where in different parts of the world. I mentioned Yemen before. I don't know if you followed on the news a while ago, but there was an airstrike carried out by the Saudis on a bus full of school children in Sana'a in Yemen. That was carried out with an American-made munition. Um, and so putting pressure on the companies and the governments that sell the weapons is definitely part of a, a broader sense of international accountability and how I think we uphold our responsibility to protect in some broader sense. With regards to the second question, the Israeli-Palestinian question is a, is a complex struggle, but I don't think any um, conflict is beyond resolution. And again, I'm an old, you know, old person, you know, who's at the end of my wits and <laughs> definitely on a downhill slide. <laughs> Will like, you stop you know, it? <laughs> from here. It feels that way on the skate ramp. I can tell you when you're 50, the, the ramp hurts a lot more when, when, when you fall, I guarantee you. Um, but I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> Israel, Palestine, right? What was it about Israel, yeah. Palestine? Oh God, I can't remember. Oh yes, so I'm old. But <laughs> South Africa, when I joined the movement, think of this for a second. I joined the movement in 1986. Nelson Mandela was a prisoner. ANC was on the ropes. You know, the country was on fire. The most common sense view of South Africa uh, when I joined the movement was there will be a civil war and a racial civil war in South Africa. And that's kind of the future of the country. The idea that Nelson Mandela would become president of a non-racial democratic South Africa was like not even fantasy stuff. It was just unimaginable. You couldn't think of a world in which that happened. So I was born in 1968 first year of the armed conflict in Northern Ireland. My entire life, there was an armed conflict in the place where my family came from. A conflict that claimed the lives of family members of mine, affected my own life, affected the community that my family came from. And again, the common sense view was, that's just the Irish, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's just Northern Ireland. Protestants and Catholics has been going on for centuries. It'll always be going on. There'll be no peace in Northern Ireland. The idea that the UK, Ireland, and the main protagonist of the conflict would be able to, on Good Friday of all days, sort out a peace agreement was 
inconceivable to somebody who grew up in the world that I grew up. So no conflict is irresolvable, but it requires political will and it requires strategic thinking. And in this particular case, it requires a UN Security Council where permanent members don't abuse their veto power in order to protect people who are abusing the human rights of others. So unfortunately, I know we we're going to take one last question, but we have to make it quick because we're nearing the end of our time. Okay, so one last question. Hey, Pam from the School of Politics and Global Studies. You were a little bit optimistic there, which was nice. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you about something else. The countries that have historically been the champions of the responsibility to protect and the champions of humanitarian standards, Europe, North America, et cetera, have actually abandoned those standards and commitments over the past few years. So we see now, for instance, interception and turning back of people in the Mediterranean to Libya, where we know there are egregious human rights violations. Yeah. We see the standards in Moria in the refugee camp in Greece, much worse than almost any refugee camp in Africa or Asia. And we see people moving through Europe, you know, being, being demonized, refugees, migrants, etc. What hope do you have for turning around the polities in those countries who have traditionally been the champions for responsibility to protect? So I think part of the, I mean, by the way, this is an audience I presume mainly made up of Americans. And I know that the issue of refugees and migrants is a, is a big issue in this country. I'm Actually, a, I would, we have a lot of folks from around the world. Okay, so we got to diverse, so I'm amongst friends. So I'm a migrant, I'm clearly a migrant and he's a refugee. And I think he is a great example. Could you get a better example? of what happens when you show compassion to people who have to leave their homes in their home country and seek opportunities elsewhere in the world. A man who is not only immensely educated, but has dedicated his life to educating others and uplifting his fellow human beings. Like that is an example of why the refugee convention is such a great thing. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> The second part of it is we live in a time, you know, I'm originally a historian, so I take a long view, you know, of how these things can, can play out. And I am actually optimistic. I'm, I'm never pessimistic because I have seen so much change in my lifetime. And I have seen even in the darkest places I've ever worked, you know, in Rwanda after the genocide, I met rescuers. I met people who were even in the midst of that saved Tutsis, hid people. So that gives you hope about the human condition, you know? And I think part of the era that we're living through, 68.5 million people, as I said, displaced by persecution, conflict, and atrocities. Clearly something is wrong. We see human rights and the humanitarian principles which have sustained the international community since the Second World War under attack everywhere. Chemical weapons in Syria, something I never thought I would see in, in my lifetime and a government get away with it. Tax on schools, tax on healthcare workers, tax on children and civilians in all these, these different forms. So there's lots to be pessimistic about. But I think part of it is realizing that we're in a fight. First part of winning a fight is realizing that you're in a fight. And so now is not a time for passivity. It's not a time for people to step back for, from human rights or from humanitarian principles or from civil activism. We need upstanders in every community, everywhere in the world for these sorts of things. And so the thing I always, you know, I've been thinking about a lot lately is one of my favorite authors is this guy, Primo Levi. I don't know if you, you know him, he was a Holocaust survivor from Italy, a Jew. And he wrote Survival at Auschwitz if you've ever read that book. It's one of the most amazing books. He wrote an even better book called Moments of Reprieve, which I recommend to everybody. And what's not known about him, he's normally defined by the fact that he was a Holocaust survivor. Before he was a Holocaust survivor, he joined the resistance. He fought as a partisan in the mountains and he was captured by the fascists, given to the Nazis, sent to Auschwitz, survived. The last book he wrote was a book about resistance. 
and it's called If Not Now When. And it's a book I, again, I recommend to, to every human being to read. But the thing about that, that I always took away from that book is we use never again completely in the wrong way. It was not a silent prayer. It was not like never again. I just hope it never again happens. It was a command from the people who survived that to us, that no matter where we are, no matter where we live, no matter how uncomfortable it might make us, no matter what the odds are against us, never again is a call to action. And I think that's how I respond to the 68.5 million. That's how I respond to the attacks, the rise of xenophobia and right-wing populism in, in Europe and in other parts of the world. That's why I rise, respond to all those attacks because my question to myself, and it's a question I would ask to all of you, is if not now, when? When are you gonna stand up? When are we gonna fight back for the principles and the things that we say that we believe in? I want to invite Olivia and back to the, I want to thank Simon, you for all. Of your thank time. you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have uh, some gifts for you, but I think um, what we care so much about at the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law and Thunderbird and ASU is global leadership. And no one embodies those principles more than you, Simon. So thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you. Oh, wow. Gifts. Yes, uh, more gifts. Uh, on behalf of the student body at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, thank you so much for being here, spending this time with us, and for that powerful call to action. Well, thank, so you. Is, uh, thank you. So much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. More swag. <laughs> Hello? Yes. So yes, thank you so much for coming. And I know, I mean, you do amazing things. And I, can, I think we can all say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and talk to us about these pressing issues. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Thank you. So thank you everyone. Uh, the first of many uh, wonderful events like this between the School of Law and Thunderbird. And so have a wonderful rest of the day and come and say hello to Simon if you have a chance. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs> Australian freckles. Oh, wow.